I think when I left office, I realized how much power I did have, because all of a sudden I had none. There is no comparison by, uh, to being governor. Being governor of a great state like Illinois is a privilege that I cherish. Well, I, I don't think there's anybody in power who isn't subject to a challenge. I think that's just the nature of the beast, particularly the political beast. Uh, in 14 years, I don't think I went unchallenged, frankly. The whole thing is just a wonderful experience trying to solve problems, get the work done, and go home. Observing its 25th anniversary as Illinois' premier public affairs magazine, Illinois Issues presents Changing Times, Changing Illinois Politics, a discussion of Illinois government and politics over the last quarter century. My name is Ed Wojcicki and I'm the publisher of Illinois Issues and I want to welcome you to our 25th anniversary event. I'm very glad that all of you can be here. Let me, before we begin lunch, take you back very briefly, more than 200 years actually, to George Washington's farewell address. Our first president talked about what it means to have a government of the people. He gave this advice to the new nation, promote as an object of primary importance, institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge. It is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. Well, we are here today to celebrate the fact that not one, but two institutions have disseminated knowledge and enlightened public opinion for many years. I'm talking about Illinois Issues Magazine and the University of Illinois. To get our day started before lunch and to pay tribute to a special partner of the campus of the University of Illinois at Springfield, I am pleased to introduce to you the president of the University of Illinois, James J. Stuckel, President Stuckel. Well, thank you. I'm uh, very happy here to help I welcome you to this special anniversary celebration for Illinois Issues. And I want to give my congratulations to Ed Wojcicki and the staff of Illinois Issues on the magazine's 25th anniversary. Uh, we at the University of Illinois are very proud of this small but mighty publication. For 25 years, Illinois Issues has analyzed public issues and policies from a very fresh perspective. Along the way, it has helped to educate policymakers, business leaders, and many others. The focus has always been on the top issues facing the state and its people from Chicago to Springfield to Southern Illinois. Illinois Issues is really a statewide magazine. Today, we're also celebrating a recent gift that will further strengthen the University of Illinois at Springfield's specialization in public affairs and in business education. We are very, very grateful to the Amaron Corporation for a half million dollar endowment. The, <laughs> the Amaron gift will create a Amaron professorship of business and government. Uh, this generous gift reflects both Amaron's support of higher education and the future growth of the University of Illinois at Springfield. But the person who's been leading the way uh, for you at IS is a very, very dynamic individual. Naomi is equally as dynamic as her institution and vice versa. The institution wouldn't be dynamic without Naomi Lin. Uh, Naomi Lin, who retired later this month as the chancellor, has led this young campus through a very, very difficult transition and merger uh, process, but has led it into the uh, initiation of new programs and has laid a, a very good foundation uh, for the years to come. So I'd like you to please welcome a wonderful woman, uh, Chancellor Naomi Lin. Thank you. 
Since its founding in 1975, Illinois Issues Magazine has helped illuminate the significant questions and concerns of a state so vast and heterogeneous that at times it seemed to suffer from an identity crisis, if not a split personality. By its painstaking and provocative reporting, Illinois Issues has reminded its readers from Rockford to Cairo, Quincy to Charleston, what unites as well as divides them. It is particularly appropriate that we celebrate the magazine's silver anniversary in Chicago. For despite its publication in the state capitol, Illinois Issues has historically drawn two-thirds of its readers and subscribers from this great city. In an era often marked by divisive politics, the information and perspective offered on the pages of this magazine have helped forge greater understanding and closer ties between upstate and downstate, urban and rural, partisan and disaffected leaders and citizens. It is equally important to foster a closer collaboration between the public and the private sectors, specifically between government, business, and higher education. Partnerships that connect these spheres of activity in fruitful dialogue hold great promise for the solution of our collective problems. Therefore, I am privileged to add my words of gratitude for a landmark gift that exemplifies the vital linkage that must exist between government, business, and education. The Amron Corporation, as President Zuckel has stated, has pledged half a million dollars to establish the, Amer the Amron Professorship of Business and Government at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Amron's vision will not only help us to forge stronger relationships with our partners in both business and government, but will assure that the University of Illinois at Springfield produces future leaders of the highest caliber who will make important contributions in both the corporate and public spheres. It is now my privilege to welcome and to thank publicly the chief, the CEO of the Amron Corporation, Gary Rainwater. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you, Jim. Um, actually, uh, Cliff Greenwalt really should be up here today. Cliff Greenwalt is the former CEO uh, of CIPS, and Cliff has been associated with the university for probably since the university was founded 30 years ago. So Cliff helped convince us that this partnership with UIS and Ameren CIPS really made sense. Um, also, Kay Smith, our Vice President of Corporate Communications, uh, and Susan Gallagher uh, also were instrumental in putting together the concept of uh, a professor of business and government with the help of Susan Burkhart from the, or excuse me, Barbara, Barbara Burkhart from the university. Uh, but we are really pleased that uh, we're able to, to make this contribution and really look forward to a long, uh, mutually profitable association with the university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Now it's time for lunch. But I do want to remind you um, that on your tables, there are some little gray cards in the middle. If you would like to write down some questions for our panelists to follow after the lunch, feel free to write a question. And people from our staff will be picking those up toward the end of lunch. They'll be going through the crowd. So enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back with you in about an hour. Thank you. Uh, before lunch, I mentioned George Washington's farewell address, which was delivered in 1796. A little more than a century after that, in 1903, Jane Addams, 
delivered a speech about George Washington. She delivered it on this site at the Union League Club in 1903. She talked about Washington as a soldier, a statesman, and a citizen. She said that if Washington were speaking here then, he would talk about a nation in which all people should be free and equal. He would say, she said, that if the spirit of equality means anything, it means equal opportunity. And if we once lose equal opportunity, we lose the only chance we have toward equality throughout the nation. Today, we stand on this same site, yet another century later, still grappling with those same issues of equality and opportunity. We grapple with these issues as a nation in the state and in all, every locale and place of business where you do business and do your daily routine every day. On the pages of our magazine and Illinois Issues, we strive to give you a balanced yet provocative perspective on how Illinois government is doing in grappling with the opportunities available to the state's people, its worker, and its children. Illinois Issues has become an important part of the public discourse in Illinois. So this is a day for celebrating, for celebrating our accomplishments and honoring those responsible for our accomplishments. This is a day for celebrating the fact that our own readers tell us that we have become for them what Washington called an important institution of enlightenment. I want to tell you a little bit about who our readers are. Half have at least a master's degree. Almost half serve on the board of at least one nonprofit organization in this state. As Naomi mentioned, almost two-thirds live in the Chicago area. More than seven in ten say they rely on us for learning more about what's happening in the state legislature. And this is especially for you elected officials. Almost three in four of our readers have made a contribution to a political campaign within the last two years. So our readers, in short, are well-educated, they're, and they're engaged in Illinois politics. We're going to get to the main part of our program shortly, but there are some people who I want to recognize. First of all, the three honorary chairs of our event, President Stuckel, Mayor Daley, and Governor Ryan. Governor Ryan sends his regrets that he could not be here, but he did write us a short letter, and he wanted to personally welcome everyone to this event. He says, I regret that I am unable to attend today's discussion, but I hope that you take great interest in the regional roundtable meeting tonight in Carbondale. <laughs> and then he says, I would extend my congratulations to Ed Wojcicki and the entire staff at Illinois Issues on this important anniversary. I also want to recognize some other people. We have one constitutional officer with us today, State Treasurer Judy Bartopinka. And we have so many members of the General Assembly with us here today. Would all of you rise for some applause? And I always like to point out our position in the, in the uh, University of Illinois. There are people here from the University of Illinois Board of Trustees. Would you please, please rise and be recognized? And there's not too many more, but I do want to recognize the members who've served on our board. Members of the Illinois Issues Board, past and present, would you stand and be recognized? <laughs> I do want to rec Phil Rock is the, the current chairman of our board. Phil, you didn't do what I said. I told you to stand. And Doris Holub, who's sitting at the table there, is our vice chair, and she's the chairman of this event.
And also, I'll be with you in just a second. Oh, I'm so sorry. But the, I wanted to recognize the members of the Illinois Issue staff, which we sat over in the corner. Would you please rise and be recognized? Thank you. And there's another group that you may not hear about as much, but perhaps my main collaborators on the UIS campus, Illinois Issues is housed within an Institute for Public Affairs, and its executive director is Nancy Ford. With the people from the Institute for Public Affairs, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. And there are many others who I could recognize. I want to mention three people who are not here today, three people on whose shoulders we all stand at the magazine. Former editor and publisher Bill Day, former publisher Mike Lennon, and former editor Carolyn Garadini. They are instrumental in making the magazine what it is today. And finally, I saved the, the best for last, actually. That's why I had to turn my pages a little bit. But I want to talk just a little bit about the origins of Illinois Issues magazine. There were three people back in the early 1970s who recognized that there was something missing in the media mix in Illinois. There was an important institution of enlightenment that was missing, and there was a publication about Illinois, devoted to Illinois government and politics. And the three people who are founders of our magazine are Sam Gove from the University of Illinois, Paul Simon, the, the former senator, and the late Sam Whitwer Sr. Now, they recognized that such a magazine was needed and they did what they could, and they got the collaboration between Sangamon State University and the University of Illinois to get this founded. Um, of course, Sam Whitwer is now deceased, and Governor or Senator Simon sends his regrets that he could not make it. But Sam Gove is here, and he's over at the table over there. Would you please recognize him? And I also, I also want to announce that on the occasion of this anniversary, we have established a Founders Circle. There's a little bit of information about it in your packet, and we want to permanently recognize Sam Whitwer and Sam Gove and Paul Simon for the work that they did in getting the magazine started. And any contributions made to this Founders Circle are going to allow us to continue to pay the writers who we have to pay in order to be an institution of enlightenment. And now, on to the main program. We, ha we are very happy here to have with, have with us today this distinguished panel, moderated by Bruce Dumont. Bruce is going to in introduce all of the panelists to you. Bruce, you probably all recognize as the host of the Illinois Lawmakers Program, and he's also the host of the Beyond the Beltway Program on radio. He is also uh, very deeply involved with the Broadcast Museum at the Cultural Center, and you know there is a connection between the Broadcast Museum and the campus of UIC. And so the, I think the longer we talk today, the longer we would talk about partnerships between Illinois issues, or not, uh, the University of Illinois and all kinds of other institutions and corporations in the state of Illinois. So now for the main event, without further ado, Bruce Dumont is going to lead our panel. Bruce, welcome. Hello, I'm Bruce Dumont, host of Illinois Lawmakers and Beyond the Beltway. Welcome to this special forum brought to you by Illinois Issues, this year celebrating its 25th anniversary. During this program, we will explore the governance of Illinois and examine the Illinois legislative process. And with us, we have four uniquely qualified panelists. They are Governor William Stratton, who served two terms as governor after winning elections in 1952 and 1956. Previously, he had been a U.S. congressman at large from 1941 to 43, and again from 1947 to 1949. He was also the state treasurer from 1943 to 45, and once again from 1951 to 1953. He is a vice president of the Associated Bank in Chicago, Governor William Stratton.
Governor Jim Edgar served two terms as governor after being elected in 1990 and 1994. He served as Secretary of State from 1981 to 1991, first being appointed to that position by Governor Jim Thompson. He served as a state representative from 1977 to 1979 and is now a distinguished fellow with the Institute of Government and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois, Governor Jim Edgar. <laughs> Senator Phil Rock, a Democrat from Oak Park, was the state senator from 1971 to 93 and served the last 14 years as Senate president. His seven terms in that role were more than any other senator in Illinois history. He is currently chairman of the Illinois Board of Higher Education and practices law in the firm of Rock, Fusco, and Garvey in Chicago, Senator Phil Rock. <laughs> Senator William Harris, Republican from Pontiac, served as Senate President in the 78th General Assembly from 1973 to 74. He was a state representative from 1955 to 1961 and a state senator from 1961 to 1977. He later joined the executive branch as commissioner of banks and trust companies and served that agency as its board chairman. After working in the private sector, he returned to state government and Governor George Ryan's administration as a consultant to the commissioner of the Office of Banks and Real Estate, Senator William Harris. I invite you all to make this as conversational as you possibly can, gentlemen. I'd like to begin with you, uh, Governor Edgar. You spent a lot of time in Springfield and around the state capitol before you uh, moved uh, to, to the, the governor's mansion. How long did it take you to really get a sense and a feel for the power that you had, and, did, and, and how long did it take you to really feel comfortable being governor? I think when I left office, I realized how much power I did have because all of a sudden I had none. Uh, the first term is, a, I think, always a challenge, and particularly with the problems the state of Illinois had financially. Uh, also, I first went in, I had a Democratic legislature that we didn't always see eye to eye. But the second term, I think, is a, was a much easier time, not just because maybe we had more money, uh, or we did have a split in the legislature, just the fact that once you're in office and you've gone through a cycle, uh, you know that everything you do is not going to cause your political defeat, uh, that uh, you can get things done, uh, people will return your phone calls. Uh, I think the, the second term, I think, is, uh, is the best time to be governor. Uh, the first term is usually a, a learning experience, uh, Often there are major challenges. The second term, I, I think you have a better sense. I've got to tell you a, a quote, and I've, all three of the gentlemen here, I've got a quote in my mind they told me over the years, but Phil Rock probably gave me the best advice my first year as governor, and he'll know I didn't pay attention to it, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> it was the end of the first legislative session, and we had gone for almost three extra weeks. It was not a friendly situation for many weeks there. And... Uh, Finally, we, we got the budget worked out. Uh, I was very concerned about the state's financial condition, and I was worried about every penny. And at the last minute, the, the, the agreement had been made. They drafted the, uh, the final budget, and they'd made an error of about $25,000. Now, I was at the point where I wasn't going to allow a $25,000 error to go through the budget because I was so concerned. And, <clears throat> this was, they, and everybody was tired. They just wanted to go home. And I called up Senator Rock who I often would call up because I thought he was a person you could usually reason with. And I said, Phil, I said, we have a problem. This is $25,000 over. And I could hear this kind of long pause, and he finally said, would you just chill out? <laughs> <laughs> Senator, I wish I'd have paid more attention to you. Uh, Governor Stratton, uh, you too spent a lot of time in Springfield around the Capitol before you uh, b moved into the governor's mansion. Uh, how long did it take you to really feel the power? It was a different time than uh, Jim Edgar, but uh, uh, did you feel it uh, quickly? Well, I would have to say that I uh, felt it uh, 
quickly. Uh, in that office, you feel it very fast. And uh, I was uh, amazed at the difference in the various offices. As state treasurer, of course, I had a pretty good idea of the state's finances. But uh, there is no comparison by, uh, to being governor. Being governor of a great state like Illinois is a privilege that I cherish. And I thank the people of the state for their confidence. And, but you have to experience it yourself in person uh, to really feel the effect of it. Uh, it's an awesome job. And uh, no matter how hard you tried, you're going to stumble occasionally into something that requires immediate attention or requires activity uh, that you don't like to uh, have to do, but you asked for the job, and by golly, you got it, and you have to do something about it. That's all I can say. Because we have four people who have always, uh, who all have had uh, great power before them, when you get power, one of the first things that frequently happens in, in every power structure in the world, someone wants to challenge you for that power. How did you handle challenges to your power over the years, Bill Harris? Well, I was never aware that I had any power. <laughs> <laughs> and you never reminded anybody that you did? <laughs> well, I, I had 28 guys that had 28 ideas, uh, not necessarily close to mine. Uh, but believe, it, the whole thing is just a wonderful experience trying to solve problems, get the work done, and go home. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, I was known as one of those who believed strongly in the enactment of the income tax. And in my district, which is largely agricultural, geographically, I think it's the third or fourth largest county, Livingston, within the, all of the counties of Illinois. And I hope you don't think I'm lecturing, but I do want to tell you the most significant interview I ever enjoyed in all the time I served. And it was when Bill Blackie was chairman of the board of Caterpillar. And it was my privilege to sit next to him when he draw, brought down to Springfield a group of about 18 of their top uh, personnel. We didn't have a, a Caterpillar plant in Pontiac yet. But I was intrigued. Now, Mr. Blackie came to the United States from the University of Edinburgh. He was an economist and taught that economics in, in his connection. And we were talking about the problem of funding state services. And this is what he said to me very briefly. You know, Mr. Harris, you can extract from the constituency from only three basic sources of personal gain. You can impose taxes on that which you own, property. That which you, you can impose taxes on that which you spend sales taxes. And at that point in time, Illinois was pretty well high on those two elements. But the rub is, his third suggestion of from which you can fund public services, taxes imposed upon that which you earn. Gotcha. That 
was enough for me and I was an advocate of adding to our source from the people of Illinois when Governor Ogilvy courageously said we've got to do it and I was the floor m manager and we got the job done. Senator with, Rock, I want to get Senator Rock's answer to the question about... I just wish power. he'd have been Senate President in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rock, what about the issue of power? Wielding power and, uh, and challenges to your power over the years. How'd you handle them? Well, I, I don't think there's anybody in power who isn't subject to a challenge. I think that's just the nature of the beast, particularly the political beast. Uh, in 14 years, I don't think I went unchallenged, frankly. And I had a caucus that was, uh, as many in this room will recall, some in this room were members of it. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I used to try to tell people is we're not going to have a caucus, because if you have a caucus, all it's going to do is cause a lot of problems. They didn't believe it. Emil Jones today believes it. The more caucuses you have, <laughs> uh, the more trouble you have. <clears throat> but I think, I think uh, any leader uh, and any elected constitutional officer uh, is going to be subject to a challenge. The question is, how do you react to it? But how did you react? Did, I mean, do you have to, do you got to swat somebody down? Do you got to make, no, you, you got to send a message? I know Harold Washington once said to me that, you know, if you don't, if you don't really smack hard the first person <laughs> that challenges you in some way, you're just yeah. going to, you're just asking for trouble. You got to do it hard. Well, Harold should have followed his own advice, I guess. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> 1981, I had to send a search party out for Harold, if you'll remember. We were, he was missing for the presidential vote at the beginning of the session. No, I, I think what you have to attempt to do is, one, you have to persuade the membership. Uh, if you're the legislative leader now, I, uh, governor is a whole different program because as the chief executive, you can propose virtually whatever you wish and should. Not quite. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you should. Uh, but I think one of the things you have to have to establish with the with the membership on both sides of the aisle is is that as the leader, you don't have a personal agenda. This is not for any personal agenda or gratification or satisfaction. What you hope to do is 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 take what the body proposes and and make something some meaningful work product out of it. As I sat, uh, frankly, yesterday afternoon on my back porch, just reminiscing a little bit in anticipation of this. And you look back from 1971 to date, uh, you can almost, uh, th there's a hundred anecdotes about virtually every, every benchmark, uh, legislative benchmark, all the way from uh, the first Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act, the first Domestic Violence Act, that a lot of those things that we now take for granted and, and just assume they were always there, they weren't always there. And they were as the result of an, an initiative and they were as a result of, of some people attempting to craft something that would be worthy of this state. And, and uh, no question that the leader has some power. If, if somebody thoroughly disagreed with me, I would give them a committee assignment, perhaps, that they weren't thrilled with or happy with. Uh, or I would uh, deny them the opportunity to do something that they otherwise could have that was within my discretion. Uh, but seldom you have to do that. I think once you establish the ground rules and once the membership sees that you as the leader uh, are a little more altruistic as opposed to introspective, I think they'll, they'll go with the program. They understand. They vote for you. Governor Edgar, how did you go about establishing your power base and your relationship mm -hmm. with another power base in the state of Illinois that, that all governors have to deal with, and that's the mayor of the city of Chicago? Well, let me comment first on sure. the, because I think a little different. The governor, I think, key for the governor that first legislative session to establish his power. And the legislature, rightfully so, I think is going to challenge that or they're going to test the new governor. And I felt in 1991, which I always looked upon as the most important legislative session, because that was my first session. And I think back to other governors that came in, that first session usually established, I think, how they, they fared the rest of their term. So I think... For a governor, it's right off the bat, and it's making sure that you don't get all everything you want, but pretty much what you propose, your budget, is something that comes back to you in the form that you can accept it. That's very important. As far as relations with the mayor of Chicago, uh, you know, the mayor of Chicago has a lot to do with the, who the mayor is. And in my case, it was always Richard M. Daley, and uh, he, uh, I think, uh, 
was very sincere in his concern for the city, and I respected that. But I also recognized that I had to be the governor for the entire state. And, and sometimes uh, we'd have different points of view that I think maybe some people might remember. Uh, and I always felt that's understandable because, again, his concerns the city, and my concern was the entire state. And that's how I proceeded. Now, uh, there were times that uh, we had disagreements. There were probably actually more times we agreed, though that didn't make very good news copy. Uh, Do you think he respected you? You would have to ask him. I mean, I never, Mayor Daly and I have different styles. Uh, he had a style that often he would speak whatever was on his mind. I would probably uh, be a little more reserved in my comments. Uh, I never took any of his comments personal because one day he might be on my case, the next day he might be on the case of the President of the United States. That was just kind of his style. Mm -hmm. And then the third day, there would be something that we agreed on and everything would be fine. So I tried never to take anything that he said, uh, particularly, or anybody else, but particularly the mayor, uh, as, as personal. It was just, uh, you know, at that point, that's how he felt, and that could change the next day. Governor Stratton, you two spent eight years working with a Mayor Daley, a different Mayor Daley. What was your relationship with the mayor, and how did you go about establishing that relationship, uh, you know, with the leader of the largest city in the state? Well, I think I uh, respected the fact that it was a world city we're dealing with the administration of, and, and it was a major part of my responsibility, as well as the mayor. And we have a lot of mayors over this uh, state, and they do a great job and they're entitled to the respect and cooperation of whoever is governor. And I want to give you a little anecdote. I can remember my father at one time taking me with him when he called on the then governor, and uh, they started talking some very intimate politics, and uh, my father apologized for my being present. <laughs> and. Uh, and the then governor said, uh, let the boy stay, Will. And so I stayed. And that was my first lesson in politics that, that day. And I've never forgotten that. I won't tell you how many years ago that is. One of the axioms of Illinois politics is that Republican governors or Democratic mayors of Chicago, which that's all we pretty much know in our lifetime, that they really, they, they would prefer that there be a Republican governor because it just it makes it easier for them to deal with that. Do you think that's true, Phil? Do you really buy into that? I'd like to try it the other way, but as, as it stands... Uh... Well, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you answer that one. Uh, you know, the only experience we had uh, was with uh, then-Governor Walker. And, and uh, his Democratic credentials were constantly being questioned, and he was const constantly questioning the Democratic credentials of those of us from the Chicago Cook County delegation. So it, it, you never really know. So I, I, I think it's fair to say that historically that your statement will stand the test that uh, Republican governors and Democratic mayors of the city, in fact, get along as well they should. Governor Edgar? Well, I, I agree with Phil's comment. I, Dan Walker was, had run against Mayor Daley in the primary, so I think that just wasn't going to probably make for the best relationship. Uh, if Paul Simon had been elected, I think we'd had a better indication of that. Uh, I think any governor of the state of Illinois has to recognize that Chicago is a major priority. Absolutely. It's not the only priority, but it's a major priority, and that the mayor is the leader of that city. And my feeling always was to try to assist when we could. Uh, and I think, again, it, politics aside, uh, that's too big of an issue to get caught up on partisanship. Now, again, you might have personality differences. You might have philosophical differences. But uh, I always viewed that uh, as a governor, I had as much responsibility and concern about Chicago as I did the suburbs and downstate. Uh, unfortunately, there would be times often when the mayor, what the mayor wanted from the state was money. And during my time as governor, we didn't have a whole lot of that. And so I often would be put in the position to say no uh, and to say no to all mayors. And that was a different point of view. The, you know, the previous uh, two years when Mayor Daley was in, uh, 
they were able, the legislature passed additional funding for the cities to the surtax and the income tax and some other programs. We weren't in that position. So I think that made it difficult, but it wasn't because as governor, and I, I can't think of any governor in recent times that I'm aware of that did not view Chicago as a very important part of the state and an area that you had to uh, provide adequate resources and concern. Yeah, and Senator, some, fr some frankly were more interested than others. You know, we, we went through in my short tenure, we went through uh, Mayor Richard J. Daley, uh, and then you had Byrne, Balandic, Sawyer, Harold, uh, and then Richard M. And frankly, the middle three, there was less than overweening interest in what was going on at Springfield. I well, even today, I mean, I think while I was governor, I mean, Mayor Daley didn't come down that often. And listening to the, the leaders, now, you had your first two years, I was there when, I don't think he was as active even as his father. I mean, I think probably no one was as active and had as much influence as Richard J. Daley did in, in what happened in Springfield. And I think that's, but that's not so much a, maybe just a person has to change the legislature. Governors don't have as much influence uh, as they used to because the legislatures are very independent. Today, the... The two Democratic leaders, I think, they listen to the mayor, but in the end, they're going to make their final decision. I didn't sense that when I first came 30 years ago. If you have a situation where you have a, a Democratic mayor in Chicago and a Republican governor, and, and, and the, the interaction between those two power structures is something that, that receives a lot of discussion, there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion between presidents of the Senate and the speakers of the House that they have to deal with, sometimes from the same party, Sometimes not. What was your relationship with the Speaker of the House that you had to deal with, and how did he fit into the power structure when, uh, when they were in the summit meetings with you, uh, Bill Harris? You know, I think that every state officer holding responsibility for the operation of the House, either uh, majority or minority, in the Senate, the same thing. I think we all care a great deal about this unique state. Illinois is really very special. So you may care, but what, what about the politics of it, especially if you're not from the same party? I mean, is there a lot of one-upsmanship that goes on? I mean, when you've got those four legislative leaders, I mean, there are four egos in that room, too. Well, I've got to tell you this. The leader of the Democrats in my four years as leadership of the Republicans in the Senate was Cecil Parti. I have to include him among the very smallest group of really good friends. We got along wonderfully, and I miss him today, believe me. So I, I think it's just a matter of human beings that care about their responsibility and know they have to make some sacrifices and let's get the job done. Bill, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I, I uh, worked, had the opportunity to work with uh, Bob Blair, Bill Redman, George Ryan, uh, Mike Madigan. And, and I think it's, it's fair to say that particularly when the, uh, when the with, with George Ryan in particular, I, I think we got along very well. I know we did. And it got a little contentious when, when something absolutely overwhelmingly partisan like the reapportionment map surfaced. Uh, because then... Uh, was that partisan? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was on my part, I'll tell you. <laughs> I think it's fair to say it was on George's, too. And at that point, uh, you know, there was, there was not the same level of... Uh, of uh, cooperation, I guess, because each of us understood that we were protecting or attempting to protect our party and our members. Uh, but, but that aside, I think just, just to, to ha have the process work in an orderly fashion, uh, to have literally the train running on time and delivering the product it's supposed to deliver, we spent a great deal of time, uh, George and Bill Harris and myself and Cecil and others, really attempting to establish the General Assembly as, a, as an equal branch of the government, in particular equal to the executive. Uh, there were some chief executives that didn't like to see the advent of that idea, and, and uh, 
uh, didn't like it when they were confronted with it. But the fact is we spent a great deal of time and effort in improving the process, professionalizing the staff, uh, professionalizing, frankly, the, the members we recruited to run for this job. Uh, and, and I think the, I think we are definitely at parity at this point. But I think one of the things that made that work was the fact that there was collaboration and cooperation between the House and the Senate, irrespective of the party. Governor Stratton, when you were uh, governor, uh, to what extent did the media set public policy, and, and did you react to what the media uh, suggested that you do? And, and how much of that did you uh, throw out the window? You wanted to do your own thing. Let me say we had both ears to the ground constantly on what the media was saying. And of course, nowadays the media is even uh, more, uh, shall I say, universal with the advent of television. And uh, right in the home today, uh, you can uh, turn on the television and or turn off a speaker. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we live in an age of technology. And that technology can be applied usefully to the operation of the political system or course can uh, be abandoned but I did think you ever did you ever decide though did you ever have a vision for something that was at odds with the editorial board of the Tribune or the Daily News or the Sun Times and you said you know what I know I'm gonna get hit pretty hard on this but I'm gonna go ahead with it and I'm gonna perhaps pay a price for it did you ever go out of your way to, to buck something that the newspapers uh, would have supported <clears throat> wouldn't have supported would have supported did you go opposite the newspapers at any point that you can recall? Well, listen, you don't intentionally, if you're governor or anybody else, <clears throat> intentionally take on any newspaper. I'm telling you right now, you try to handle it with kid gloves. You agree but, with that, uh, Governor Edgar? Well, I, I think I agree with what Governor Stratton says. You, you keep an ear to the ground what the media is going to react, how they're going to react, because that's where most people get their information today, particularly since precinct committeemen aren't out there delivering the message as much as maybe years before. What people know about government is usually what they see on television or a few read in a newspaper. Uh, so it's very important what they write about. Now I have to tell you I probably worried more about the front page than I did the editorial page. And there's not always any correlation between the front page and the editorial page. There'd be many times that the editorial page might be urging me to do something Whereas the front page stories would be undercutting if we were trying to do that. Uh, but I, I don't think there's any doubt that the media is extremely influential in setting the agenda. For example, when we were trying to, to get the change in school funding and also the, the shift in the tax structure, that's not an issue the legislature really wanted to deal with. I mean, that's raising taxes and that's not something they like to do. Spending money was all right in there, but they didn't want to raise the taxes. And they kept trying to, you know, brush that under the rug. We, we went to the media because we knew if the media would keep talking about it, that kept it on the front burner. So the media, I think, plays a major role. And sometimes I will agree with the role they play if they agree with me. Or if they disagree with me, then I think they're too powerful and we ought to change it. <laughs> if you if have we a, good, review, enough, go ahead, a go good enough cause, you, you should be capable of selling it to the press. And if you can't, then there's something wrong with the cause, I think. Sometimes I thought there was something wrong with the media, but that's it. <laughs> if we were to review all of the significant political events as it affects the state government over the last 25 years, I think one thing that probably would be, if not at the top of everyone's list, certainly maybe be number two, and that is the, the cutback amendment. Uh, how did that change things in Springfield, Bill Harris? Well, it eliminated the opportunity to have a Republican a member of the General Assembly from Chicago. That was the first result of it, it seems to me. And uh, uh, I don't know whether the body politic themselves uh, really realized what was going to happen uh, when you went from a three uh, to uh, strict two uh, representation uh, areas 
Uh, and, you know, up until then, Illinois was unique among the 50 states. And we had minority representation, uh, which is just truly wonderful uh, to have some member of the other party serving in the General Assembly, uh, in the House, uh, getting things done. Uh, it was a mistake. It was sold as something that was going to save money and uh, improve government. Did it, Phil Rock? No, neither, frankly. Uh, it wound up costing more money because, as I say, at the same time on a parallel track, we had the effort going by all of us uh, to professionalize and update and bring all the technology to bear and so forth. So uh, the, the ultimate savings was, was minuscule, if any. Yeah. But I think the, the disaster was in the... In the irrespective of party, establish the fact that a governor's in office, you would have under that system one person from every district of the governor's party, minimum one person from the governor's party. And that gave those people in that district an access that frankly sometimes they don't have today or yesterday. Uh, as as well-meaning as some of the state reps and state senators are, uh, they're not always as responsive to a member of the other party uh, in terms of dealing face-to-face uh, -face or, or uh, with the administration or the governor's office. And I, I, that, that was a system that worked, and it worked well, and, and uh, it was a shame we had to lose it. And I, for one, have been exploring ways with others to try to bring it back. But it Does take a constitutional amendment. It recently... <laughs> It's been suggested that there's been a growth of mean-spiritedness uh, in Springfield over the last 25 years. Is that one of the uh, one of the products of, of the cutback amendment, in your view, Jim Edgar? Well, I don't think there's any doubt it changed the nature of the House. When I served in the House under accumulative voting, it was a much more, uh, I mean, laid back may not be the right word, but it... Uh, Comfort. It was, yeah, you could you deal across the aisle. I mean, it, also it didn't have as much party unity. Uh, so I don't think there's any doubt it changed the nature, made it more partisan, and I think with that more partisanship has become a little more mean-spirited. Uh, the House is not a uh, friendly place, or not as friendly as it was when I first came as a legislative aide back in the 60s. Uh, it's, it doesn't have the variety. It's In some ways, it's, it's a larger state senate from the point of view the representation selected the same way. So uh, there's no doubt it has changed the whole nature of the legislative process, and I would think most who observe the process before and after don't think maybe it's it's been in the best interest. Even, and I was one who originally thought single member district would be better because you'd have clear cut representation, accountability. Uh, looking at it today, I'm not sure that uh, it's it's been worth what we had we gave up or what we now have for that accountability. One other relationship that uh, really does not get discussed much is the relationship between legislative and executive leadership in uh, Springfield and representatives of the state of Illinois at the congressional level. You served twice uh, in Washington as a, as a congressman at large. What it was, was the educational. What, what was the relationship between uh, the congressional delegation and state government when you were governor, Governor Stratton? Well, as I recall, we had... Uh uh, those years at least, uh, we didn't have many difficulty back home, we hoped, <laughs> but uh, there was a tension, I suppose, but uh, the members of Congress are sort of a, a club of their own, they, uh, as they should be, and uh, as a matter of fact, I guess I'm still a, a member of the former members organization. They're still organized after you leave. But were they were they helpful? I mean, if you had things that you needed support in Washington, uh, w the relationship between the United States senators and the members of Congress, I mean, would you meet with them on a regular basis so that they would be providing support for the people of Illinois at the federal level? Well, as a 28-year-old congressman, I wasn't meeting with many senators, I can tell you that. No, when you were, when you were governor, when you were governor. Oh, when I was governor, that right. was different. You were the youngest member of Congress, we should mention, when you were in Congress. But uh, when you were governor, what was the relationship? As I recall, it was uh, uh, 
pleasant with reservations. Jim Edgar? Well, I had excellent relationships, and I was very appreciative of the support we received from our congressional delegation. Uh, of course, different today than when Governor Stratton, we have maintained a Washington office, and those people are in constant contact with the uh, congressional delegation and the staff. Uh, I can particularly uh, came into office. We had a lot of problems with the federal government over Medicaid and other issues, and uh, I spent a lot of time on the phone with Dan Rasenkowski. I had never met him until I was elected governor, and he came to my office, sat outside my office for a half an hour before the secretary told me who he was, and she didn't know really who he was, and I about had a heart attack that I'd kept the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee <laughs> waiting to see me. <laughs> he came in and said, Governor, he says, you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, that's behind us, I'm here to help you in any way I can. And uh, any time I ever needed help uh, while he was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, he gave me help. In fact, I got accused in one, he had a, a difficult primary toward the end, and I got accused of endorsing him. I didn't endorse him, but we did plan a lot of uh, groundbreakings uh, to coincide with that uh, <laughs> primary election. <laughs> And, and I might say the rest of the delegation, too. Uh, Alan Dixon, when he was there, he was in a position, he was part of the leadership. And Republican or Democrat alike, we could call, and they always were extremely supportive of whatever the state's agenda was. Uh, I couldn't have asked for any better support from the congressional delegation.